we'd like to do today is to actually go out in the field. We, we covered some of the theory yesterday. And so today is really to try and develop skills and build your understanding on how to undertake this rapid assessment of wetland ecosystem services. So, one of the objectives of the day is to make you realise that different types of wetland perform different benefits for society. And this will be the same in your countries when you go back to your wetlands. Not all wetlands provide the same amount of benefits to the same types of people. So one of the things we need to think about when we're doing this form of assessment is who actually benefits. So when you're looking at a wetland or a different part of a wetland, trying to think who benefits from this wetland. And we'll look at that amongst different types of wetlands within St. John Bay. <coughs> and part of this is also to get you thinking about the different types of services and the whole concept about how a wetland is providing those services and how a wetland is functioning to provide those services. Now we can't make you experts in every field in the space of two and a half days, but the idea is to try and get you thinking about some of these concepts around ecosystem services. And so, really when you're out in the field, and we'll work probably in, in larger groups, then we'll break down into smaller groups this afternoon, you really got to start thinking about who benefits and the link between the service which different wetland types are providing and using that list of services that we looked at yesterday as a starting point. And what we would really appreciate as well is, as I said yesterday, the Republic of Korea is sponsoring a draft resolution which will go to the Ramsar COP in Dubai in October. So any feedback or comments, positive or negative, about the approach, things that you think this isn't working well, I don't understand this, I could do with some guidance on this, this bit seems really simple, or well, haven't you thought of something else? Any feedback, be it positive or negative, we'd really appreciate that, because that's, the more feedback we get, the better the approach can become, and the more useful it will be to yourselves as wetland managers and to other people elsewhere in the world. So please, if you don't understand something or you want clarification, just ask myself or the other people from the Ramsar Regional Centre and they can feed the information back. So we'd really appreciate your comments and feedback. <coughs> oh, what's happening? Okay, so we're, we're hoping we will visit at least two wetland types. If the day goes well and if you work hard, we might end up visiting five different types of wetland in this area. Now this area is a, is a wetland park and it combines both natural habitats of the, the estuary and the bay with some man-made and human-made wetlands. So there are rice paddies which are managed for conservation and we can, we'll have a bit more information about them when we go to them. There are tidal mud flats which are very important for water birds and shorebirds. There's natural reed marshes and swamps around the edge of the mud flats. And there are some home uh, human-made wetlands around the visitor centre, which are really designed for SEPA, for education and communication purposes. And then there are tidal creeks as well, running between the mud flats and through the reed beds. And we'll hopefully go out and do an assessment of hopefully all five of these types of habitat. Um, this afternoon we'll go on a boat, there'll be two boat trips because otherwise we have to walk across the mud flats and that would probably mean the mud would come up to about here and we'd probably get quite dirty. So unless you want to walk on the mud flats we will go on a boat. So this is just to illustrate some of the habitats. We have the rice paddies, the tidal creek, the mud flats, the human made wetlands around the visitor centre and the, the reed swamps. And there are boardwalks going throughout the reed swamps, there are footpaths along the side of the rice paddy, and there's paths along the side of the natural wetland, uh, sorry, man-made wetland. And we can visit the tidal creeks from the same boardwalks 
as I said, the, the mud flats we will visit from a boat. So just to get your bearings, we're up here in the visitor centre and what we will start off doing is we will walk down to have a look at this rice paddy here. Now those of you that might be able to see this, if you go on Google Earth it's very clear, there are some markings actually on the field and the rice paddies here are managed for conservation and there is an arrangement between the Isunshan City and the people that run the visitor centre to pay the farmers to leave some of the rice in the field so it acts as good food for the wintering birds that come in. And every year they plant different varieties of rice and they mark out patterns either with words in the Korean language or pictures. So this is still a productive rice paddy but it also serves conservation and communication reasons and purposes. So we will take a walk down to the rice paddy. There is also a large extensive area of reed fringe which also extends back through here and we will, go out, we will look from this footpath here at the rice paddy that way and then the reed swamp and we'll see how we are doing for time. We'll probably complete that, come back here for lunch and then this afternoon we will split into two groups because the boat can only take a certain number of people and the first boat will go out down to the mud flats down here and we will look at the mud flats and um, whilst that boat is going out we will also have some people looking at this tidal creek area up here and then we will swap over and then we'll come back either back into the classroom here um, just to recap on the day and see how we've got on. So that's roughly where we're going. Yesterday the last exercise I showed you was basically showing this sort of area of the bay but I didn't look at that area on purpose because that's where we're going today. So that's the, the general sites. What we'd like to do is have people working in small teams so maybe sort of splitting the group into six groups just six small groups maybe four six people and then when you're in your group to discuss things amongst yourselves it's really useful to have a conversation and to throw ideas around because your own experiences will be really valuable and each of us can learn from each other so to ask questions about different services do you think this is happening and also when you're looking at doing an assessment think about which area it is you're actually assessing so for instance if you're looking at the rice paddy are you just looking at maybe one or two fields or are you considering the whole area and you might want to say okay well I'm only going to look at a small area of the rice paddy here because I can't see the whole area so I'm not sure what's going on and likewise for the reed swamp you might be able to from this standing on this bank here you can see a lot of the reed swamp you might say well actually it's all fairly uniform it's quite a homogeneous quite a similar area of habitat therefore I can consider all that area of reed swamp as one area so have a discussion as well about the extent of the area that you're covering and we have the the field sheets which will be circulated and please make sure you try and complete all the sections and whilst this is only a training exercise it's very useful to get into the habit of trying to collect as much information. So assessing all the services and if you are going to break the services down, I, I stressed yesterday that the list is just a guide. It, you don't have to use everything on that list. You can subdivide things. So when it says food for the rice paddy, you can actually say rice rather than just food. When you're looking at the mud flats, we might see fishermen out there. We might see people collecting other um, animals. So you might want to say shellfish or fish. So try and make it as specific as possible. And then complete the section. So in the comments, what evidence did you see? So uh, who do you think is benefiting? And make sure you complete the sections on not just the scoring, but also the scale. Is it local people? Is it maybe a regional value? Or is it an international value? And we'll make sure we have everything with us. I don't think it's today but now that I've said that it probably will rain oh, 
So if I say it's going to rain all day long, it will be sunny. Um, so again, make sure you have um, the, the recording sheets with you, pens, pencils, etc. And if you have sun cream or hats, if you need it. I definitely need sun cream because I have no hair. So I've already put cream on my head. I think uh, even bottled water. Yes, I think water is very important. And I know uh, Xiongbe and uh, Hannah have handed out some water. So, But we will get a chance. We will come back to the centre for lunch and we can have something to drink here as well. But yeah, water is important. Uh, and also there are bathrooms as we go round, but if people want to use the bathroom before we leave, it might be an idea. There is a bathroom near this building. So that, that's the approach. Um, so we will leave the, the centre now and we will walk. And it will take us maybe 10, 15 minutes to walk down to this bank down here. Um, Mr. So, is there anything you want to add, Norman? Is that that seems fine? Um, oh. So, does anyone have any questions? So, you, you have the handouts. You have the information from yesterday, apart from one person who managed to leave it on the bus and <laughs> is now lost forever. Um, we will have recording sheets. What I suggest is when you're in groups is maybe one person does all the recording and the other people talk. But if you want to write information yourself, feel free. Behind us all, we have the rice paddies. Now, these rice paddies are managed for conservation as well as food production. This time of year, we can't see it, but if you were here when the crops were growing, they plant different variety of rice. So you, and they set out patterns, which might be a bird or crane flying, or it might have a message written in the Korean language. And so if you come here when the rice is growing, you can see the different colours. And there is an agreement with the local farmers that they leave some of the rice in the field so that the cranes which come here can come and other, other birds can come and eat in these fields. So they harvest some of the rice themselves, but a lot of it they leave. Um, and they get, they get, the farmers get paid by the city for the conservation management. So the farmers are still rewarded for growing the rice, but instead of selling it for food, they basically sell it to the birds as food. Okay. In terms of the water, on this side we have brackish and saline water. So this creek you can see, this channel goes out all the way down to the estuary, which is over there. But this side of the bank, you can see that elevated land behind us, this is fresh water. And the drainage that comes off the hills and from behind us comes down through a network of channels, which they manage to manage the water level for the rice paddies. And you will see there are some structures which control the water and hold the water back in here before it goes out into the tidal area. Um, and we will see one of those structures. We will walk around and look at one of those structures later on. So the first area you want to assess in your five groups will be this area of rice paddy behind us. And I suggest that because this structure might not be able to take all our weight, mm -hmm. that we maybe one or two groups stay up here and other people get down. You can still see the rice paddy from the top of this bank looking into it. And in your groups, if you start doing the assessment, thinking for the different ecosystem services, is it a very big benefit? So that would be two pluses. Is it just maybe a local benefit for a small number of people, which would be one plus? <coughs> or if the service isn't being delivered by this area, which is always possible, it's a zero. Or if you think that actually by the way the land is being managed, that it is a negative, then, and a few people are missing out, that's a minus. If a lot of people are victims or suffering from the, the management, then it'd be a double minus. Or if you're not sure, put a question mark. 
So if you go down the actual assessment for each of the services and think about each service, and if you want to, you can change the language if you're not quite sure. So where it says food, you might want to replace food with rice production. Um, and then think about the scale of the benefit. So who benefits from this? Is it just local people that benefit? Is it maybe more widely across a greater, larger region? Or is it maybe a global importance? And so, for instance, for something like education, the visitor centre that we are at, and this is all part of the visitor centre, people will use this walkway. Rob, just uh, interfere because yep. I will forget it later. Uh, what's the area of the paddy field? Um, the total area, I don't actually know. Um, but I think you need to define which area you're looking at. That's something yeah. you need to have a conversation in your group. And do you have any uh, uh, inventory, how many farmers are working here? They, uh, they have a record here. Yes. So they have all registered uh, farmers. Yeah. And any community behind the field? Yeah. Of course, yes. Yes. Yeah. And what are the size of the community people? Uh, all I the information? No, exactly. But the they may have some brochure or publication about it. So we can see. Yeah, we can yes. provide it later. That's right. Yeah. But it, there is, it's almost like a, a community of farmers that all work here together for conservation as well as for their own farming. You can uh, consider it like a, a couple hundred. Yes, couple it's, it's hundred. probably no more than that, yeah. Roughly. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of things like education, people come from all over the world when they visit Korea. They, Sunshon is known as the, the sort of garden city, the eco-capital of Korea. So you have international visitors that come here for tourism, for recreation. So when you're looking at who benefits, there could be an international benefit from environmental edu education. Um, but go down the list and think about the scale, think about the, the magnitude of the service. Is it a zero, one plus, or a one minus, or a double plus, whatever. And then try and write down a little comment about why you've said what you've said in terms of the assessment. And then slowly work through the, the first sheet. And when we finish, we'll give you maybe about till about 11 o'clock just we might be done before then but just and then we'll move on and then we'll walk around and we'll look at an area like this of the reed bed but looking over the estuary um, once we're finished but I'll be walking around and also Mr. Sir's colleagues from the center from the Ramsar Regional Center they can help maybe answer some questions they've been out here many times with myself and likewise our two other resource people we've got the doctor and Priyani wherever Priyani might be I'm here. Okay. <laughs> so, but yeah, feel free to ask questions. But the main thing is ask questions of each other in the group because you shouldn't underestimate what you already know. So, use your own experience, and that could be very beneficial. Are so, they used, uh, fertilizer and chemicals for no, they, they don't use chemicals. They're not allowed. So, it's a part of the conservation agreement that these are effectively, they manage it like an organic um, production. But there are other fields up there which are more intensely managed. You saw some of the greenhouses and the agriculture that we saw as we were coming into the site. So the water coming off that land does come through here. So this will control the flows of the water and also some of those chemicals and fertilizers that will be going there will be treated before it goes out to the estuary. And you told Palmer left somebody here for the yes. water board. That's right. They're getting some compensation. They get paid the compensation from the city. city. That's right. <laughs>
So that's why it's a good indicator that this is still relatively fresh water, but then we're very high up the estuary. And you'll see this afternoon when we go out on the boat, we'll go right out onto beyond the, salt, uh, the mud flats, beyond the end of the reed bed. So this area is very important. It's important in terms of its biodiversity. It provides a very good nursery ground for fisheries, and there's a lot of fish caught out in the bay. Um, it also buffers against storms, so it's a very large um, width of reed bed, so if there's high uh, storms, spring tides, again this absorbs a lot of the energy from that and protects the shore. But it also helps buffer against the intrusion of salt water, because we saw this is a freshwater system on this side, otherwise you couldn't grow the rice. And so this is protecting the intrusion of salt water, especially with sea level rise. So this is, causing, this is forming a good buffer. Um, again, in terms of all the education and the uh, inspiration and other cultural values, I mean, you can see there's a footpath along here, people walk along here. There's a small education building just down there further on. And so it has many, many values. So again, in your groups, if we can split into our groups again, maybe scatter ourselves along this bank. And if we can carry on with the assessment, We'd like to try and get this one finished so we can leave here no later than quarter past 12 because we need to walk all the way back and back to the, through the centre and just not far from where the coach was to go and have lunch. So the longer you take, the less you have for lunch. One question. What, oh, fine, please. I was going to say, any questions? This footpath? Yep. It's like a barn. It is, yes. Yeah. So this protects, it's a flood embankment. It stops this area from flooding. Uh, so they've reclaimed that area. So if you'd come here a hundred years ago, this would have all been tidal mud flat. Okay. It could have been a reed bed. It could have been a reed bed or a mud flat. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. So, but this land has been reclaimed for agriculture as in many places around Asia, especially around the Yellow Sea. So that would have all been natural wetland. And that has been reclaimed for agriculture. It has been drained and now is managed as a freshwater like system. Uh, doctor, I have a half question. Half question, okay. Uh, are the community collecting the reed? Yes, so the reeds here are being, they are collected, they're harvested in some areas. And you might have noticed that in the education centre, they use it for building fences and screens. Oh, that's from reed. And that's from reed. When they are collecting, in what season are perfect for collecting Um, But I'm not sure here, but normally... It's not a question, it's a two question. <laughs> <laughs> so that's four halves. Yeah. One point half, one point five. <laughs> so, so they, they allow the community to harvest. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, the, um, but also the, set, the, the because this is managed by Sunshine City, they will, they will harvest it, oh. um, and they can use it in sort of ornamental mm. features such as. Oh, hang on. One question at a time. I'll do this one for. <laughs> There will be a management plan, but for this sort of reed, the main management one, we won't notice it today, but if we had time, you can see on the top of the hill up there, there is a platform. Yeah. Yeah. If we went up there, you can see, and some of you might have seen the pictures of Sunshine Bay, which has these circular areas of reed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like almost like circles of plants on, in the mud flat. Mm. They are managing and they are cutting around the perimeter to stop the reed spreading out over the mud flats. Mm. The mud flats are very important for migratory birds, yes. more so than the reed bed. And the reed is trying to encroach onto the mud flat. And so there is a management regime which is cutting the reed to stop the reed spreading onto the mud flat. So they're not losing the mud flat habitat. Yeah. Are these land belong to government or private? So this is all governmental land. This is owned by the city. And this is all Ramsar site as well. Uh, what about the fire incidents? They, they might be incidents of fire, but they're probably quite rare. This is a, a, a more of a temperate environment, so it's quite wet. But fire is a natural occurrence in this sort of wetlands, but it's probably quite unusual. And if we split into our teams, maybe on the boat, maybe some go out the back, some stay in here, maybe some go outside. And we will look out across the mud flats. 
Now that the mud flats here are very, very important for the migratory birds and the shorebirds, but they're also very important in terms of depositing sediment and supporting fisheries. And I don't know whether we will see them today, but they have the traditional mud skipper fishermen who sit on little rafts that go on the mud and they throw a hook and they hook the mud skippers that we had at lunchtime. But we might not see them today. I don't know, will we see them today? Maybe the fishermen? Maybe not. Maybe not, I think. Um, and so really the only bits we're looking at are the mud flats. And you'll see from the, the tidal channel, the tidal creek, then you have the mud flats and then you'll see the reed beds that we were looking at this morning. And you really want to do an assessment of the mud flats. And if you come at certain times of year, for instance in the winter, you'll see many, many birds on the mud flats. Today we'll probably not see many birds. There might be a few heron or egret. Um, but the mud flats again are very important in terms of absorbing energy from the sea, storing sediments, filtering water, and they're very extensive. And as we saw earlier on this morning, there's a problem with the reed bed encroaching. So people are trying to manage the reeds and stop losing mud flat. Uh, Depending on where we stop the boat, we'll decide whether we do one bank or the other bank. So we'll have to see where we actually stop the boat. And we'll just choose an area of mud flat to look at. What you might see is in the distance, you'll see maybe some posts and some nets, which they use for fishing and collecting uh, shellfish as well. But you might see that as we get around the corner. Um, and then we'll turn around and head back and get back to the uh, shop where we just came from at about 20 to uh, 20 yeah about 20 to 3 so it'll be about 40 minutes we'll be on the water so you have to work very quickly when we get there but if we don't complete it there you can always complete it when we come back so any questions about the mud flats if you want to get off the boat and walk on the mud swim to the mud flats you're very welcome to but you'll get very dirty so i have a duty because i'm from you're from mangroves. There are no mangroves here. We're too north. <laughs> so, but yes, if it was in your country, we would have mangrove here. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And you can see already there are some shorebirds outside yeah, here. Already, yeah, one shorebird. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so on this side, you have the, the mountain on this side. But as we get past the, the end of the mountain, then you'll see the whole estuary open up in front of you. And these boats are very, very popular for the tourists to come out and go on the water. It's another part of the experience of visiting St. Jean Bay, uh, the eco centre. Um, and so for people who aren't familiar with coastal wetlands, that, that dynamic is very, very important, that variation in the tide. It drives a lot of the ecological processes, a lot of the biogeochemical processes. And so the tide we have at the moment isn't a spring tide, it's a small tide, not one of the really big tides. But you'll see where we got on the boats, from where the boats are moored to the top of the shore, it's quite a high difference, about three metres. So there's a real tidal variation here, and the tide comes in very quickly because it's a funnel as you come up the estuary, so the water gets faster and faster and rises quicker the further we go up. And the tidal influence extends right up the creek for quite a distance towards St. John City. So at some times of the year, on the mud flats along here, you'll see the traditional fishermen on their little boards, just throwing a line with a hook, and the hook, they don't catch it in the mouth, they just grab the, the uh, mud skipper and they just pull them in and catch it. And they're very skilled, they'll throw the hook right onto the mud skipper and pull it. Fishermen, fishermen uh, pay some taxes to the. I don't know. I, do the, they don't know. I don't think they have, have uh, to pay taxes. Fishermen here, they are licensed. Ah, right. So the fish. So the. Allow to anyone, to some uh, right. people who lives here and then register. So they need to get licensed to get cash. Right. So what Mr. Sir was saying is that fishermen are licensed by the government. So. Not anyone can come and fish here. So there's a community of fishermen that practice the traditional fishing and they have a license. How many are allowed to fish here? It's 
probably only. It's how not. Many? Yeah. How many fish are there allowed? Uh, not much. Not no, it's not many. It's, it's, a, it's probably tens of fishermen, not hundreds. It'll be tens of fishermen. channel so the seawater comes up the channel and goes quite a long way up but equally the fresh water flows down the channel from the river system. And what I would like you to focus on is the actual channel itself so not into the reed bed because we've already looked at the reed bed and we've looked at the mud flats in between but the main channel area and think about the differences of this channel compared to the other sites and do an assessment on the channel. You might want to look a little bit up the channel up there, that's just another arm that comes down from that area, so it's up there. So if you look at the main channel and a little bit of that channel and do the assessment on that as a different type of habitat. Because what we're looking at here is we've looked at different types of habitat, which are all part of the same Ramsar site, but we're looking at different habitats. And what we'll do tomorrow is we'll look and see the different types of wetland, even though they're part of a larger wetland complex. These different types provide different services, so the different people benefit from different parts of the wetland. Is that clear? Can we trust you on your own to do the assessments without us going off on the boat? So when we're on the boat, we'll make you what to do. So what you can do, one group might want to go down there, or even two groups, you can actually, if you walk down off the boardwalk, you can come underneath and you can sit down. Even though this looks like an old boat, it is actually a seat, so you can sit down there, or you can stand up here and do the assessment. So, any other questions? In, in, in terms of the channel, the, the water levels fluctuate, so on low tide they're low, and the flow is dominated by fresh water. As the tide comes in, the water level rises up and spreads out into the reed bed, um, and it's dominated by tidal water. You do get some fishing up here, so there are some fishermen that fish in this area. Um, and obviously, you have the tourist boats, so people are, the tourist boats do go a little bit up there. And all the, the drainage from the city and from the wider catchment obviously all runs down this channel before going out. So, uh, is this the Magnusian thing? No, not, not the wider edge, just, just the channel, just the channel. So if you think about when we were looking at the map yesterday, and I had a, a picture of a, a sort of coastal wetland system, there was a channel and there were the mud flats either side of it. Here you're just looking at the channel. So you're trying to focus on the channel. Okay, any other questions? Right. If you were in there, they would look the same. It's only because you're looking at an angle, you're looking at the reed heads. It's because we're above it. Yeah, it would be exactly the same. So what you have here is the, the very sort of light grey, light, very light brown colour is the dead reed from last year. And this is what we have now, this is this year's young growth. Okay, just a bit of background. So this is a tidal creek, so at low flows, the, most of the water is actually fresh water coming down from the city and from the catchment. And then the water level might vary by maybe two or three metres. And then you get the influence from the sea of the coastal waters coming in, and that's why it's a very brackish. It's neither fresh nor salty. And you'll see as we go around that the mud flats are very, very extensive. At the moment, they're quite narrow. They're maybe only 50 metres. And when we go around the corner, you'll see there's vast extents of mud flats, which get exposed at every low tide. They're incredibly important for wintering birds, passage birds coming through. But they're also important for fisheries. And unfortunately, this time of year, you don't really see the traditional fishermen that fish on the mud flats. And they sit on little boats, and they basically just throw their hook and 
then, and basically catch on the top of the fish and pull the fish. But you'll also see as we go, and you can start seeing now, there are some sticks stuck in the mud of the mud flats. And that's what they use those for fishing and for shellfish and catching other and setting nets oh, to catch yeah, fish. Yeah. How do they catch shellfish with the net? Well, no, they, some of this, they do some shellfish where they'll actually, the shellfish will actually attach themselves to the oh, post and things. Okay. And then they'll take the whole post. Um, and in this area, this is the area where the government are trying to stop the reeds from encroaching on the mud flats. And so, these mud flats are really important in terms of storing sediments. Um, they do, in some areas, they get a, um, algae forming on top of them. Uh, so they get quite extensive areas of algae. But also, some other areas around here, people collect the mud from the mud flats and they use it in cosmetics huh? to put on their face. Cosmetics. Yeah. They collect the mud to put on your skin. To make your skin look beautiful like mine, which oh. makes me look so young. <laughs> it makes me look like I'm in my twenties. Yeah. So really? You want to take some mud from here to your country? <laughs> so you can see now the mud flats are very extensive. And if we were to go beyond that far point, what? it goes all the way around. No, 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 no. I'm not joking. No, 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 no seriously. It's serious. Yeah. And so, if you can start doing the assessment, but focus on the mud flat, so from the edge of the water to the edge of the reed. Okay? Right. Team leader, take charge. And so you can see the posts with the nets and the very extensive mud flats. So no one lives out here, but there are fishermen and a fishing community that come out here. Okay, so you must start work now. You stop being tourists and now you start work. So in winter there are many thousands of cranes. Cranes? Yeah, that come out here on the mud flats. Migratory? Yeah. So they migrate up to Siberia, come down from Siberia, oh. and they overwinter down here. And they will come out on the mud flats, they'll go and eat on the rice paddy. What is the name of this? Uh, it's a grey heron. Grey heron. Okay, so this is the next site we're going to undertake the rapid assessment on. This is obviously a human-made wetland. This is quite a young system. It's probably only about three to five years old. But it's very important in terms of public awareness, education. So people come here, there are trained uh, staff members who do pond dipping. They take out insects, show the public, describe the different animals, different taxa. Um, so it's very important in terms of education it also takes a lot of the drainage water from this surrounding area which comes and gets stored in here and the water then drains out down the far end into another sort of series of ponds and then back into the drainage system which ultimately will go out through the rice paddies to the estuary before uh, beyond so this is a very different type of wetland it's fresh water completely fresh water um, and very much designed around education public awareness uh, communications. So what we'll do is we'll split into our groups and we'll move maybe sort of each group maybe just move 10 meters around the pond and we'll do an assessment of this and see how you come up with what sort of results you come up with compared to the other ones. So does anyone ever have any questions about this? How does the water come? How does the water come? So the water some of it comes from the other side from these freshwater ponds over there um, and I think they're fed from drainage which comes in further up the valley and some of it comes from the runoff from the hard standing around here but it's all fresh water that comes into here. They obviously manage this quite intensely so they keep the vegetation open because they want to have that mix of areas of fringing reed. This is the Phragmites, the same reed that we saw before. 
Um, but there are some other species. This is a different type of um, species. But they want the open water mix, so it's really good for invertebrates. There's lots of dragonflies, um, lots of mollusks, um, beetle species, and you'll see in the water. Uh, and there are some other sort of aquatic plants in here, but it's quite a young, immature system still. But one of the things with wetlands is that, especially if you build a small wetland in the middle of a large wetland, a lot of wildlife comes into it immediately. And so this isn't really that important in terms of migratory birds, but there are, and you can hear the birds singing, there are many small passerines and other birds that are in, and they do, so they even nest in the vegetation around. You can walk all the way around it, so if people want to have a wander around it, you can. But we'll try and go about half an hour or so here, and then, depending on how we're doing, if we've got time, just beyond, you can see that area over there of bare ground, beyond that there's a sort of a very relatively recent, maybe two or three year old wetland, which is also a human made wetland, but it's very different to this one, which we might try and look at before we go off and get the coach. So any questions on this one? Hopefully it's fairly self-explanatory. So we split into our groups. Everyone has got a sheet, if not Xiongbo, wave your sheets around. Xiongbo has sheets if we need them. Okay, so this is our last site. You'll be very pleased to hear that. Um, we've just looked at one human-made wetland. This is another one that's behind us and you can walk around the whole area. This um, used to all be car park. And what they've tried to do at the center is to reduce the impact of traffic. So make people use buses such as these ones and park, stay in the city or get a bus here rather than drive here. So the visitor centre actively tried to reduce the amount of car parking to make it harder for people to come here in private cars. And they converted this, which was all car park, into a wetland. And the wetland is behind us. This was built maybe three or four years ago. And if you go down the far end, you can see it takes drainage water from the agricultural fields further up the valley. So basically between here and the city, as you go up the, the river, most of the floodplain has been converted into rice paddy and intensive agriculture for vegetables. Um, and so all the drainage comes down through a network of drains and small channels. And at the far end, some of that water gets diverted into this wetland here and then goes out of this wetland either directly to the creek or into this small area, which was once reed bed, but about a year ago got dug out and has been turned into islands. But this was all once reed bed. So the area we want to look at is this man-made wetland here. As I said, it, it takes the drainage from the agricultural fields before it goes into the creek. And also it takes the drainage from the car park as that runs off. So when we get heavy rain here, that ends up in the wetland. Again, it's a very young, sort of immature system, but it's slightly different to the other pond in the fact that not many people come here. Most people might use the restrooms here, go to their car, but very few people actually bother walking around here. There is some car parking still, but it's only on very, very busy days that people park here. So in terms of the human interaction, it's very different to the previous one. It's not designed with a photo point. It's not designed with seating next to it. Um, so it's a slightly different type of wetland in terms of human-made wetland. In terms of the wildlife, it still attracts some wildlife. They've put in islands. The idea is to try and get birds to nest on the islands, but I'm not sure whether they've been successful. I've, personally, I think the islands have been badly designed and not very attractive for nesting birds. And they've planted several trees and several different species of plants. But you still get quite a lot of um, dragonflies, um, other amphibians such as frogs in here and then many other sort of invertebrates in the water course. So that's really it, so this is our last one. So again, I think if we, if, what I would suggest is the groups is maybe sort of take a little walk around it and then if you want to come back and sit in here to do the assessment, um, that might make more sense. Um, anyone wants to use the restrooms, they're there before we get back on the bus. But if we have maybe sort of 20 minutes, half an hour, that should, do you think that should be enough? It is quite, it is quite
It's all fresh water, yeah. It's, it's fresh water, yeah. So what we'd like to do tomorrow is we will go through the results and we'll look whether we had similar results, different results from group to group. And we'll have a discussion amongst us why one person, one group might have said that was two plus and another group might have said that's a one minus. And if we can't decide it, we have a fight and we say whoever wins the fight, they get the score. So we will have a decision tomorrow. We'll go through the different assessments and we'll also look at some of the lessons you've learned, things that you thought worked well, things you think could be improved, things that you're maybe unsure about. Um, and what we'll try and do is we'll try and summarise all the different wetland types we've got and try and get a consensus amongst the group that we think that seems to be the right score for the different wetland types. And then we'll have a look at the wetland types and say, well, are different wetlands performing... Sorry, my phone is ringing. Are different wetlands performing different ecosystem services? And if so, why? What is trying to understand that a bit better? And then what I'll do is I'll go through a little bit more in terms of how you can anal analyse and present the results. And I'll present a few case studies from different places in the world, uh, from Sri Lanka, from Myanmar, and from other, some other locations. And that will basically be pretty much my session in the morning. And then the afternoon, I think we have some more time for some other people to make presentations and to have some more general discussions about wetland management and how RRCEA can help delivering wetland management and uh, implementing the convention in your countries. So that's myself. So over to you, Mr. Sir. Unless there's any... Thank you.